Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here, a part of this uh, celebration. Um, I actually started teaching at FIU again this semester. Unfortunately, it's undergraduate classes. Everybody pretty much gets an A because everyone's a potential voter, so you don't want to uh, offend anybody. Too late for you guys. I didn't get to teach at law school. You get A's as well. But uh, they earned it. I'm kidding. I just said that in front of cameras. That'll be uh, used against me. But anyway, thank you guys. I am. Um, I can, first of all, congratulations to all of you. I um, graduated from law school almost 15 years ago. These, I don't know how to wear this cape thing. Is this fine? Like that? Right. And um, I explain to people that have never gone to law school something you're going to probably start explaining to them now. You don't really learn anything in law school. You learn, let me finish. You learn, because there are people in the back row that paid for all this are like shaking their head. Like, well, what, is, you, you, what you learn is a way of thinking, and you'll never think the same again. What you learn in law school is a way of analyzing issues, and you'll never analyze the simplest things in life the same again. And it, the miracle is how it works time and time again. You already see it here at the school. Your two speakers, your two student speakers that stood up indicated to me how clearly lawyerly they've already become. First, Mr. Lohman stood up, and he described the school. You know, he described burnings and fights and bickering. And my first thought is, you know, what kind of operation are you running here? But. <laughs> My second thought was, this guy's laying the groundwork for some class action lawsuit <laughs> against the school, which was amazing. And then Mr. Faulkner stands up and made very clear that he was being shot down by 19-year-old waitresses. Now think about that. A, he's fully cognizant of the statute of limitation. And B, he's not laying in an area of gray. He could have said 18-year-old. He said 19-year-old. He bought himself a little buffer. So these guys are becoming lawyers faster than you guys ever anticipated, and I congratulate the faculty. Great job. Now, I had prepared some notes for today's speech. It was important. I wanted to share some knowledge and wisdom with you, and I wrote it down on the plane to Washington on Monday, kind of touched it up on the way back yesterday, and then I left it in the front pocket of the airplane. So someone's reading a really good speech on their way back to Washington. So instead, what I thought is I'd just share with you a few thoughts about what I've learned in the last five months, in the last 15 years, and I can pretty much do that in 10 minutes, amazingly. Um, and I hope that that fits in your um, view of what I was trying to do today. The first thing I would say is the Senate's a unique place, and I'm honored to serve there. When I first got there, people told me, you know, when you get here, you're going to walk in into a room of people, and you're going to say, I've seen that guy before. You know, you literally, these are guys that have been there like 20, 30 years. I've been watching these guys on TV and gals on television doing interviews, and, and you ask yourself, you know, how did I get here? How can I be in the company of these distinguished people? And then after a few months, you're going to look around the same room, and you're going to ask yourself, how did they get here? <laughs> well, we're almost at that point. That's my first observation. <laughs> my second observation, when I, early when I got elected, one of the senior members, I'm not going to say his name because I don't want to embarrass him, but he's a lot older than I am. I'm actually the second youngest member of the Senate. There's someone who's seven days younger than me. In fact, I, my birthday's tomorrow. It's just kind of a cheap plug, but I just threw that in there. And I, uh, I turned 40. I feel 41, but I turned 40. And uh, so he sat me down and he said, Marco, this is a place that runs on seniority. And the great thing about you is you could be here for 30 years and you'd still be the youngest guy. So uh, those are my two observations about the Senate. As uh, I was flying up here yesterday, uh, the guy sitting next to me, he's like, what are you working on? I said, well, I'm working on a commencement speech for the law school. He goes, well, how many people are graduating? I said, it's like 170. He goes, and he's under his breath. He goes, oh, yeah, that's all we need, 170 more lawyers. <laughs> but we do. We do. Because the law profession that you're about to enter, to and many, enter into, and many of you already have, has always had a unique place in American society and American history. And what I want to say to you over the next 10 minutes is that you are entering this profession and this stage in your life at one of the most critical moments in the history of our republic. And I know political people love to say that, oh, this is the most important moment ever, we're at a crossroads. This one really is. And I hope that I can convince you of that in the little time that I have with you. Because I believed that when I ran for office, and that's why I ran for it. And I believe it now, and I know it now more than I ever did before. We're having two fundamental debates in our country that will define not what the next five years are like, but the next hundred. Those two debates are, number one, what should the role of government be in our country? And number two, what should the role of America be in the world? And neither one of these questions have an easy answer. 
The fact is that over the last 200 and some odd years, the people that were here before us, many who are in this audience today who have positions of leadership, through hard work and sacrifice created an extraordinary country. America is not perfect, never claims to be. It, in my opinion, is simply better than anywhere else on earth. There isn't a nation on earth who I would trade our history with. And quite frankly, even with our problems, there isn't a country or society on earth that I would trade our future with. But that doesn't mean that we have been without challenges in our past and won't be facing them in our future. One of our challenges is the reality of what role should government play in our society. And outside of cable talk shows and all the bickering, it's a legitimate debate. Because on the one hand, we are a prosperous nation. And we expect our government to be able to do certain essential things. We are too prosperous a people not to have a safety net to help those who cannot help themselves. We are too prosperous a people not to have programs that assist those who retire so they can live with dignity, with access to health care and the basic needs of life. On the other hand, the fundamental fact is that the people who were in charge of government over the last 20 or 30 years make promises they can't keep. They've lied to you and to me and to all of us. And the fact is that today this government spends one and a half trillion dollars more than it takes in. And you can't keep doing that forever without getting into a lot of trouble. So we are facing that reality and it has to be solved and confronted. The other thing is we, may, we face major societal issues that have to be confronted. All over the world, children are obsessed with learning. In places like China and India and other nations, it is the central focus of their society for their kids to learn and to be empowered. That same drive no longer exists in our country. And sometimes that comes as a byproduct of your prosperity, you become complacent. But there are consequences to that. The fact is we cannot continue to be outperformed academically for 15, 20, 30 years, two generations back to back, and assume that it's not going to have consequences. It's going to have devastating consequences. Within that is the notion of what should government be involved in and how can government solve it. It's a legitimate debate and one that I encourage you to be engaged in as lawyers, as public servants, as advocates, as members of the civil society. The other debate is about America's role in the world and that's always complicated. The world today is as dangerous as it's ever been. It was a lot simpler when there were two or three really powerful countries and they worked everything out. They talked bad about each other, they screamed at each other, they pointed missiles at each other. But ultimately neither one of the sides wanted to die so they always worked it out. That was by and large, but for a couple of instances, the story of the Cold War, and it's gone. The world now doesn't have that. It has America, which remains the only superpower on the earth. It has three or four countries that are growing into that status. These are countries that want all the benefits of being superpowers, but none of the responsibilities. And then you've got other countries that are teetering on the border of collapse, threatened from within and without by both societal and political pressures. The world's problems have always been too big to be solved by one country. They're even bigger today. And America has to realize that on the one hand, there isn't any, there's no problem, major problem on earth that can be solved by one single country. They have to be solved by coalitions of countries that come together and face it. But the institutions that we created after World War II to lead that effort, those institutions are old and outdated. They were built for the Cold War, now the modern 21st century. And so America's constantly getting pulled into struggles and issues around the world because we're the only power on earth that can summon people together. And it's becoming harder to do that. We have to desperately work on those two things. This is my general observations of the challenges that face our country in the 21st century. And because they face our country, they face the world. So you may ask, well, what, is, what, is, what solutions do you have to all these problems? Well, I left that on the plane too, but no, I'm kidding. I, uh, there are no simple solutions. In fact, one of the things I learned in my five months there is that most of the time, in public service, and you'll find that in your legal career as well. You don't often get to pick between a really good choice and a really bad choice. Very rarely do you have the luxury of having two very easy choices, one good and one bad. Sometimes it's a choice between two bad choices, and you're trying to figure out which one is worse if you don't do it. And I think oftentimes with the problems we face, that's true. I would just give you my three pieces of advice, not ideological or political in any way. The first is, that on the, we do have to figure out this right balance of government, the balance between doing too much and too little. On the one hand, we're not anarchists, and we shouldn't be. Well, maybe some of you are anarchists. Most of us are not anarchists. There's a role for government. Government has a role to play. We want our water to be clean and our air to be breathable. We want our streets to be safe and our schools to function. We want roads to drive on and infrastructure to commute and transact on. And government plays an important role in that. We talked about the safety net and the need for programs for retirees. These are real, legitimate functions of government. On the other hand, government can't solve every problem. 
Behind every problem that exists, there isn't some government program that can solve it, as much as we wish there is. Believe me, I, I, it's a lot easier to pass a law than it is to go out there and do some of the things that it takes to solve these problems. But every problem our country, our world, and your life faces doesn't have some law or some political program that can solve it. More often than not, these programs are solved by people whose names you'll never know. They'll never be on the cover of a magazine. Their stories will never be written. But every single day, they're doing something to change people's life. One person, one neighborhood, one community, one family at a time. Some of you have done that already in your public service. You have a chance as lawyers to do that again. What I'm saying to you is that as public service, not as politicians and if you, by the way, I encourage any of you that want to go into public service to do it. But if you decide that what you want to work is at a legal aid society or for guardian ad litem, or you want to use your law degree to help some individual who needs help, that's a, not only is that a valid way of serving, it is in many respects a more effective way of serving than some of the ways that get more attention. So understanding and balancing the proper role of government is critical. The other thing I would say to you is that as a nation and as a society, we have to embrace that while there are a few problems that government can solve by itself, there are also very few problems that government doesn't have a role in solving. And I would encourage us to follow that route in our debates. As far as the world is concerned, I would discourage you from what I call modern isolationism, from this temptation that countries and nations and people always have when times are tough to say, well, who cares what's happening halfway around the world? Now, we can wake up tomorrow and decide that we want to be Belgium or we want to be Luxembourg, but we're not. Just like you can decide to wake up tomorrow and decide you're 15 years old and have no responsibilities, but you do. America is not a small nation that all of a sudden can decide to retreat from the world. Even if we retreat from the world, the world will follow us, and so will her problems, to your very doorstep one day. These problems are real and they have to be confronted. And though they hide behind ideologies and religion in some parts of the world, they're really old problems with new faces. Our nation, our world, our people, throughout the history of humanity has always been plagued by people who want to live life a certain way and they want to force everyone else to live the same. And that's the same problem we face today all over the world. They used to hide behind nationalism or some other political ideology. Now they hide behind some distortion of a religion. It's still the same. And that's why all over the world as we speak, you see abuses that are historic in their effort and proportions. I read a story just a week ago about a young woman who was sentenced to be raped by 14 men. You know what her crime was? She didn't commit a crime. Her brother was accused of committing adultery. And so her sentence was for her to be raped by 14 men. This happened in Pakistan. It's outrageous. We should never be ashamed as a nation to call that for what it is. These people are barbarians, and I would say they were animals, but it's unfair to animals. And let me tell you, we are the only voice in the world loud enough to say that. And yours should be a part of that voice. Do not be afraid to embrace these causes. Do not be afraid to point your finger at the violations of human rights. Because if America doesn't, no other nation on earth will. If no people on earth are willing to stand up and speak on behalf of those whose rights, universal rights, are being violated, what country on the planet will? Because ultimately, that's the essence of our founding. Our nation wasn't founded on political principles. If it was, then the American Revolution was just a colonial rebellion. It was just another country that wanted to have its own name. Ours was different. The American colonists rebelled not because they, didn't, they were tired of being English subjects, but because they believed that every person on earth was born with certain rights. That your government is not the source of your rights. Your politicians are not the source of your rights. Your creator is the source of your rights. That's what the organizing documents of this nation say. And if we stop believing that, and we stop fighting for that, and we stop representing that, we will lose what makes us different and special. And do you know who's charged with defending those principles above all else? The legal profession. The profession you are about to enter into. And so I think this is an exciting time to be involved in America. We have real challenges, but the world is coming our way. All over the world, people are being pulled out of poverty and into the middle class in places like India, China, Brazil, Turkey, all over the world. That means there are more people alive today to buy the stuff we invent than ever before. That means there are more people than ever before with money to visit the United States and to do business here. And if you drive down Brickell Avenue, you will realize that when people from all over the world do business here, they hire a lot of lawyers from Miami to help them. These are positive developments that we should embrace. Because in this new world of global competition, America can win again. Our people haven't changed. 
This student body reminds us that we are the most dynamic, creative, entrepreneurial, and inventive people in the history of the world, and we still are. Our government and our politicians are not up to the level of our people, but our people are as great as they have ever been. And because they are, the 21st century can be an American century as well. That's what we have a chance to build together. And that's what I believe we will build together. In closing, let me say that days like today remind us of all these things. Because it was just 15 years ago that I sat at the Knight Center in a chair like the one you're sitting in now as a graduate of law school. My parents sat where yours sit now and your family, just a few, you know, rows behind. This day is as much about them as it is about you, especially in a school like FIU with the kind of student demographic that we have. You see, many of you are the children and grandchildren of people that had dreams when they were your age, too. It's hard to believe that, but when your parents were your age and your grandparents were your age, they probably, many of them, wanted to be more than what they were able to become. It's not their fault. It wasn't because they weren't talented or because they didn't work hard. It's just because of circumstances. Some came from countries or societies where no matter how hard you worked, you could only go so far because your parents weren't the right people or you born born in the right family. There wasn't real upward mobility. Others lost their country. Maybe they were lawyers or doctors or engineers in the nation of their birth, but their country was taken from them through a political turmoil. And so they came here and became dishwashers and valet parkers and bartenders like my dad. They woke up one day and realized that the hopes and dreams of their youth were gone. They would never be able to be who they had wanted to be when they were your age. Not because they weren't had the talent or the ability, but because it just didn't work out. And so for many of them, your life became their mission. That you would have the chance to do all the things they never could. That all the dreams they had for themselves would be realized in you. I hope you realize that maybe on the day you were born, they held you in their arms and in your, in your eyes. They saw everything they ever wanted to be. And for years, they worked and sacrificed maybe two jobs, maybe long hours so you could do all the things they couldn't. Today is an extraordinary day for them. They probably will never be able to describe it to you fully. And 15, after that, 15 years after that date for me, I struggle to grasp it myself. It's what I love about FIU, and it's what I love about America, that that story I described to you is almost impossible anywhere else in the world. And what you and I have a chance to do together at this time in our history is to ensure that we are not the last generation of Americans who live in a country like that, but that, in fact, we continue to be a beacon of, of hope for the rest of the world, that one day they, too, can live in a place like the one you and I share. God bless all of you. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.